Hello everyone, Jackson here on behalf of Torfine.com and Future Days, and today it's another exciting episode of Artist Interviews. I am sitting with Mark Gemini Thwaite, formerly of The Mission, and Gary Newman, and currently Peter Murphy, Lords of Acid, and his own project, MGT. How are you doing today, Mark? Uh, I'm doing good, Jack. How are you? You know, I'm doing pretty well. It's a nice day out. It's my day off today. Enjoying the sun, enjoying the nature outside. It's just a beautiful day. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're lucky to be, you know, as we were just saying, lucky to be in uh, California. Um, I live just a couple of miles from the beach near Santa Monica, so it's great just to be able to get some fresh air, go outside. Lots of people still keeping their distance uh, down by the beach, so that's great. You know, these are weird times indeed, but I can think of worse places to be holed up for a pandemic. That is very true. There could be a lot worse places to be held up. But hey, at least, you know, we have this, this blue skies, the sun shining, the warm weather. So you know what? You're right. There could be worse places. So today we're going to ask you a couple of questions and see where it goes from here. Are you ready to get into it? Let's do this. Right. What are three of your most memorable moments from your musical career? Well, the first um, major band that I joined, I mean, the first professional band I joined was Spear of Destiny, a British alternative rock band. I joined them in the late 80s uh, when I moved down to London. Um, I was dating a girl. I'm originally from Birmingham in England, uh, second largest city in the UK. And I started dating a girl who lived in London and I eventually moved down there. And shortly after moving down there, I joined Spear of Destiny. And um, then I applied to the mission um, which was formed by Wayne Hussey and Craig Adams, the original Sisters of Mercy guys from First, Last and Always. And they formed their own band, The Mission. Uh, the guitarist had left a couple of years before. This was around 90, in 92. Uh, I applied for the gig and I got it. Uh, so one of my first, I mean, this was a big deal to be in a band like The Mission. They were playing arenas in the UK, you know, in 1990. Uh, they'd gotten really big. Uh, so were the Sisters of Mercy as well, who had kept going. So Goth was really big back then in the UK. Like the Sisters had like a number one single. The Mission were doing arenas as well. You know, top five albums. And um, so joining, well actually, one of the most memorable things with The Mission was actually being invited to go and audition with Wayne Hussey. So I was given his address. He lived near the Black Mountains, um, near Wales. You know, total Led Zeppelin mode with a country house and a studio and Black Mountains in the distance. Um, and so that was really memorable to it sort of go. To, I was actually invited to go and stay overnight. So go and work on a new song with Wayne and Mick Brown, the drummer at the time, the original Mission drummer. And they just wanted me to see what I came up with and just hang out and then have dinner with them and drink and stay the night and... That was really quite an, an unforgettable experience. And then fast forward a, a couple of years, so when uh, the first album that I recorded with the band was coming out, uh, there was actually a Greatest Hits compilation that was put out called Sun and Substance. And it featured a, a remix of Tower of Strength, remixed by Youth of Killing Joke, famous producer. And we were on top of the pops, which, you know, uh, anybody from the UK will tell you it was the biggest TV show, to, music TV show to be on in the UK. You know, BBC, national television, you know, watched by a potential 60 million people. And I went on top of the pops with the mission and we performed Tower of Strength. So that was one of my first, you know, mind-blowing experiences to A, to do Top of the Pops in the first place, which is sadly no longer going. It's, it was cancelled a few years ago, but it's, it's infamous, you know. And just to be performing with The Mission on a show like that was truly mind-blowing. After uh, The Mission split up, Wayne split up The Mission, and um, we did a couple of albums, and then he broke the band up in 96, and he went to live in America with his then American wife. And uh, I got invited to audition for Tricky, who was a seminal trip-hop, British trip-hop artist from Bristol, one of the original Massive Attack crew. It was on their first album. And um, I got the gig with Tricky, uh, quite a curveball in direction from, the, from playing in a goth band like The Mission. But Tricky actually always liked dark rock. He was a big fan of Susie and the Banshees. He loved bands like Tool. He'd been touring with Tool a few years before I joined. He covered Susie and the Banshees and bands like that. 
So he actually quite liked the fact that I came from a goth rock background. And uh, one thing I'll always remember with Tricky was um, we were playing, a, we were touring in America, we were playing a show in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, there was a Motorhead poster backstage. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of Motorhead as well. And uh, Tricky was too, and he was just like, oh yeah, I love Motorhead, yeah, fucking great, blah, blah, blah. And as we were going back on stage, it was very common for Tricky to just want to make stuff up on stage, like uh, impromptu jams. We've even started gigs with a jam sometimes. He was really, it was almost like playing in a jazz band where anything went. And uh, he said in my ear, as I'm walking back up, Mark, play the riff from Ace of Spades. You know, which, thank God I know how it goes, right? So I go on stage, I start playing the riff from Ace of Spades, totally impromptu, as an encore, and the band join in, and his band, you know, like this Perry, the black drummer from um, uh, Aswad, famous reggae band, Wayne, uh, black bass player. Like, it's like, it was like playing with Sly and Robbie, you know. So I'm doing this Ace of Spades riff in a sort of, a, you know, usual, you know, Fast Eddie, Motet style. And then they come in with this, like, funk rock groove that they just came up with on the spot. And then Tricky just started rapping on top of it along with Hawkman, who was our like, Jamaican toaster, the crowd went absolutely insane because they recognised it was Motorhead, but then it went into something else. And they, the audience could just tell. We were just totally making this fucking up as we went, you know. So that was a seminal moment uh, that I'll never forget, you know, jamming Ace of Spades with Tricky and this amazing, you know, primarily black sort of funky you know, dubby band. It, it was a, uh, it was great. You know, I, I learned a lot musically from playing with these guys. It's fantastic. The third one was, um, well, I remember when I was um, really young, you know, like 13, 14, and I had a Bon Tempe electric organ. You know, you plug it in, it's a good organ sound. Um, didn't really know how to play keyboards, but I remember working out how to play Our Friends Electric by Gary Newman. Now, that was a number one single in the UK. It was a big deal around 79 and uh, 1979. And then you know, many years later, I actually became friends with Gary Newman uh, in the London scene. Uh, his wife was a big Mission fan and uh, she would bring him to Mission shows in, in the 1990s. And I befriended them both and I'd be invited to their house for parties and get togethers. And then Gary's record label invited me to uh, like, there was a hybrid album that was recorded, which was people reinterpreting Gary Newman's songs. So I was invited to do a version of Our Friends Electric, I got, yeah, the song that was number one in the UK back in 79, and uh, this wreckage. And then I actually was invited by Gary to go and mix the tracks. As he re I redid the music in like an industrial Nine Inch Nails-esque style, because I know Gary's into that. And then Gary re-sung the songs and so that was one mind-blowing thing that he invited me to his studio so we could mix the tracks together. You know, so imagine that. And then fast forward to 2013, I was invited by Gary to do the Splinter Tour of America with him. And we're playing Our Friends Electric Live. So from 1979, you know, when I'm like 13, learning this song on a little electric keyboard to fast forward, I think 35 years, I was playing Our Friends Electric Live with Gary Newman on stage. So that was, obviously a, a seminal mind-blowing moment for me to be playing that song thinking of myself as that you know if i could just say to my 13 year old self hey man you're going to be playing this song with gary newman on tour in america you know in 35 years time i just would have been it would have blown my mind so yeah there you go those are some really exciting moments that you're sharing with us right there i mean being a teenager you know at 13 years of age you know playing that song and then all of a sudden fast forward you know yeah. Here we are, you're playing on stage with Gary Newman, you know what I mean? Yeah. You look over and you go, oh my God, holy <coughs> shit, that's Gary Newman, and I'm playing this song on stage with him. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, it pretty boom, yeah. it takes you back to it being 18 pretty... right there. You know, that's, yeah. that's freaking amazing. And you know, like what you were mentioning too before, like when you were, when you joined the mission, going back to that time where you're there at the Black Mountains and then you being able to hang out with them and kind of experience what they're like and like get a, get a sense of who they are. And then all of a sudden, boom, here you are. If you look back, you kind of go like, I can't believe that that little moment there led me on to this path that I am today, like led me on to all of these amazing things that occurred since then. You know, yeah. and uh, look at where you are now. I mean, you are like everywhere. 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> I try, you know. You got to yeah. diversify, you know. <laughs> yeah. What would you say is your favorite album slash EP that you've ever worked on? This one's quite difficult. I've actually done quite a few albums over the years with the Mission and Tricky. I did three albums with Tricky. I did like four or I think five albums with the Mission. I did albums with Peter Murphy and records with Al Jurgensen from Ministry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think um, probably one that stood out was I joined Peter Murphy's band in 2005, the year that I moved to the United States. And um, Peter Murphy's part of the reason that I live in Los Angeles because his rehearsals... I moved to the States. I was married to an American. I could live anywhere in the States, yeah, theoretically. She was from the East Coast and she wanted to... Uh, set, you know, she wanted us to live in the East Coast near New York. But uh, I got asked to go and uh, do this Peter Murphy tour in 2005 and the rehearsals were going to be in Los Angeles. And I preferred the idea of coming to LA. I'd just done 15 years in London and uh, I just wanted to go somewhere that was far removed from London, the concrete and steel of London. LA seemed great, you know, palm trees, beaches, pretty girls, you know, vintage cars. So uh, I ended up in LA rehearsing with Peter Murphy and uh, this fast forward a few years, we ended up recording, which, which was my first album with Peter Murphy, uh, an album called Ninth. And the sessions for that actually took place um, in uh, Woodstock near New York uh, with a producer called David Barron, great producer. He worked with Lenny Kravitz and many other great artists. And uh, we were recording in this uh, Puritan church. Um, I forget the name of it. It's like Spaceland or something like that. But it's an old Puritan church that had been converted to a studio uh, in the Woodstock Hills. And again, just an amazing experience. Uh, David wanted to capture us doing live performances of the new material, which he'd primarily written a lot of it with, with Peter. Uh, he, uh, David's a, a very accomplished piano player. So we reinterpreted the songs as a live rock band, having my own vibes and riffs and so on. And it was just an unforgettable experience recording this album with Peter Murphy and Woodstock. And uh, it came out a couple of years later, it was ninth. And uh, yeah, that was really um, a big deal. Uh, also, you know, doing a Christmas song with Al Jurgensen of the ministry was, you know, surreal. You know, in it, we recorded that in his home studio in El Paso at the time. He had a studio there, 13th Planet. So that was amazing. And um, also just, I, I released a solo album, um, in 2016 under MGT, my initials, um, put that out on SPV Records. That was called Volumes. And that was obviously tremendously satisfying to put out my own record, which was like all, all my own music. And I performed most of the instrumentation, guitars, bass, keyboards, and drum programming. Um, and a couple of cover songs on there as well. We, I did a, an ABBA cover with Vile Valo from him, uh, which did really well. So that was, I shouldn't go without mentioning you know, doing a first solo album, which was a whimsical thing. I'd just never done my own thing with my own name on it. So I did that for fun, getting all my friends to sing on it. And that was obviously really memorable as well. You know, that, that album there, <coughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of versatility in that album. Mm. Like everybody that you worked with, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, it, it was really great to see that, like, you got to work so hands-on on everything, you know what I mean? And, you yeah. know, like, you, you know, working with different people on it too, but, like, you got to really kind of push that that thing that you felt inside out into the world. Like, you really got to get all that creativity out. It's one thing, you know, like, when you're playing with other uh, other artists, you know, and you're making other, you know, other music and you're helping to contribute to a collective effort, but when you have that time to really kind of push that sound forward like the sound that you want to push out i yeah. mean you can really you can really create some amazing things and and you you definitely can hear it in that yeah my original idea was just i wanted to put out uh, some material under my own name you know before i died and a, a large chunk of it was that de old demos that had just never been used by the mission or or peter murphy or, or anybody else i would always be writing riffs and chord arrangements and verse chorus, verse chorus, middle eight. I have all these demos knocking around and I, I had some time on my hands and I decided after working with a band called Primitive Race, uh, which featured like Tommy Victor from Prong and uh, Raymond Watts from Pig and uh, Krabby from Pop Will Eat Itself, all these um, 
Josh from Revolting Cox. It was a guest thing with loads of different singers. And I ended up mixing some of it in my own studio. And it suddenly gave me the idea, hey, I could put out my own record where I just ask people like that to sing and I'll mix it. I've gotten enough experience uh, on some of my demos. So I sent out my demos to all the singers that I knew, other singers that I'd worked with and also some that I hadn't, like Vila Vala. And, um, you know, many of them responded saying, yeah, I, I like that demo, I'll sing on it. So they would send me their vocals back and then I'd mix them in the track. And that's why the album sounds so diverse. It wasn't deliberate. It's just that it was like lots of different demos from over the years. Some were recent, some were new, some were old. And it was, there was no agenda as to what style it was going to be, you know. So that's why it sounds so varied. And then of course the singers also inject the variety into it as well. And it was very satisfying. And it was actually Vile Valo who was like, oh no, you know, you definitely need a, a video for this, this cover we're doing as an ABBA cover. I just thought it was going to be a self-release, probably a digital self-release. And uh, he was like, no, 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 you should have a video and you, you should have a record label. Let me get my manager on it. And he actually got his manager involved, got me talking to a record label. And then the record label funded the video that we, <coughs> that we shot and released. And so it became a bigger deal. But my original intention was just to kind of have it something that's up on Spotify you know, with my name on it. So yeah, it's great the way it, it turned out. Definitely, you know, and it's, it's funny how it kind of snowballs like that. You know, you kind of go yeah. like, oh, I'm just going to put this little thing out there. But then when, you know, you get everybody involved, mm -hmm. everybody's like, hey, let's, 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 let's push it out more. Let's get it, let's get, let's blow it up. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's really great to see that it kind of just whoosh, took off from there with that. And another thing you were mentioning too, a little bit ago, working on, on Night. In that process, like with working with Peter Murphy, what was that like, like working on that whole thing together? really good you know it's uh, it actually took a while to the, the initial album sessions we did the whole album Woodstock over a, a week or two period but then uh, they kind of worked on it in, in post-production for we went back out on tour and I think Peter ended up negotiating a deal with a different record label network records and then so on and so forth so I think it took like two or three years for the album to finally come out uh, but when I hear the album, it's still the core of what we did in those sessions in Woodstock and then various overdubs that we did afterwards, you know. Um, David also played keyboards on, on, on the album. So there's lots of little touches that he applied to the record. And it was a, a really enjoyable process. It's a great record. Well, it, it definitely is a great record. And you can tell a lot of heart and soul went into that, you know, went into creating yeah. that, you know, a lot of attention to detail that was done yeah. on that. So, you know, thank you for, for, for making some amazing music and putting out some really amazing stuff. Thank you. What was the drive behind getting you into making music and performing live? Well, shortly, yeah, maybe a year or two after I'm um, working out Our Friends Electric on the Bonds empty keyboard. Uh, I, I still, I'm still rubbish on keyboards, by the way. I'm still like this. But um, uh, my best friend at school, Paddy, uh, Paul Bryan, he got a guitar from a, from a catalogue. You know, you could buy these Les Paul copies from a catalogue. This was around 1980, I'd say. And, um, you know, I was intrigued. You know, he was like learning guitar and I was like fascinated by it. And so I asked my mom if I could get a guitar, a Les Paul copy for a catalogue as well. So I got a satellite Les Paul Pro uh, copy. Uh, in black, of course, and uh, and so he was always about three months ahead of me. So you know, I kind of would practice with him and learn a few chords from him. You know, got my chord book. I'm pretty much self-taught, but I think initially I was learning stuff via watching Port Paddy play. And and then uh, yeah, we formed a band together. Did our first gig at school. I think we were called Stallion, or maybe it's Trans. I think it's Trans Am was the first name. And uh, yeah, playing covers and uh, metal and stuff from the day. So yeah, um, and I think even early on, I was um, struck with the bug to compose. You know, I've, I've always written my own riffs and chord sequences. And so that, yeah, that's something that struck me from early, early on, right, trying to write my own songs within a couple of years of playing. Never been a singer, I always leave that up to the vocalist, but I've always come up with my own music, so I see myself I like to think of myself as like the Jimmy Page of the project, you know. Yeah, Jimmy Page, you never hear him singing, but he comes up with all this great music. So I'm always trying to emulate somebody like him, come up with this great music and then present it to a singer to sing on. But yeah, I'd have to thank Paddy, my friend at school, who was still in touch. He 
he ended up, you know, sort of losing interest in playing music and getting married and moving away from our hometown. But uh, we reconnected on Facebook uh, a few years ago. And uh, I obviously went on to, you know, take it way more seriously than him and join some professional rock bands. And it's nice that we can keep in touch and he's very supportive. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah, you're right. Just like the Jimmy Page, you're constantly working, you're constantly creating. Everything that you're doing, it's like, it, whether or not it turns into a song, it's still you creating, you know? And, and right. from early on, I, I, I know it's funny that you were mentioning like your, you know, like how, uh, you know, getting your first guitar, you know, like learning from your friend. And I think for a lot of artists, that that is sort of kind of like the beginning of that journey where you kind of go, you know, hey, I want to start, you know, playing some music. I'm just going to do this just to see if I can do it. You know, I know yeah. for me, it was like kind of that thing. Like I started playing this little Fender guitar like back in high school. And then, and then I started to realize I'm not really all that great at guitar. So let me just try singing. So I started singing. Right. And right. before you know it, here I am in a band and I'm playing in high school. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and, and fast forward later on down the road and you, you know, you, you say, oh, you know what? I can continue going with this because I feel there's something in my blood. I feel like I'm a performer or I'm a creator or something is in my blood where I have to get this out. So, and yeah, you know, sometimes it's like some people, they go, you know, I'm ready to move on to the next thing. But for people like, for people like you, you know, you're like, hey, this is my focus. This is what I love. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So it's great yeah. that you stayed on that path. Yeah, I became pretty obsessed with it, you know, whereas Paddy, you know, he was great and he was, I felt like he was a better player than me for the first year of our playing together. Um, but then he, you know, he kind of lost interest in that, probably, you know, got a girlfriend and started taking that more seriously. And I just became super obsessed with, you know, everything was about my, whatever band I was in at that time and writing songs and playing gigs and super obsessed. Yeah, I just totally got the bug. Yeah. And, um, you know, when people ask me, oh, you know, how, how, you know, how do you explain your success in music? Um, you know, what you've done, all these bands you've played with. I think it, it just comes from an inner drive to just constantly going to be want, wanting to be doing it, you know. I'm not one of these guys that sits in my room practicing scales for eight hours. I'm not one of those uh, Steve Vai, you know, uh, Joe Satriani type players. But, but nevertheless, I am probably constantly obsessed and constantly thinking about the next song I'm working on or the next this or the next that. There's definitely an obsession that goes on and that drives you to be successful if, if you've got a talent in it. You know? It really is true. I mean, you know, you're not, you're right. You're not sitting there all day, like for eight hours a day, just going back and forth on it. But like you, you, you do have that drive. You do have that drive to be creative, you know, and you, and you, yeah. you want to keep pushing that forward. It's like that. I think that's, I think that resonates with a lot of people out there, especially artists, you know, and people who want to continue creating. It's like, uh, if you feel that drive inside of yourself to want to, where you wake up and you're excited about music or you're excited about writing or singing or producing, whatever it is, if you're excited about that, don't just say, hey, oh, it's whatever. It's, it's not. It's something calling to you. It's something clinging, you know, pulling you in that direction. So listen to it. Take advantage yeah. of it because great opportunities will happen when you listen to that feeling. And I know that uh, just by listening to it and just by letting yourself do it and be okay with doing it, you've had some really amazing things happen. I think that if you had have just said, ah, it's whatever, you know, I think you'd, you'd be in a diff different position, yes, but I don't think that, I think for everybody out there, if you just listen to that, you can open up your life to a world of possibilities. Yeah, totally. What are you looking forward to accomplishing the most moving forward? Well, I'd have to say, um, having been, you know, pretty much stuck in this lockdown for the last three months, you know, um, I had a tour booked with Lords of Acid, who I hadn't performed live with before. Uh, we were going to do a US tour. It was going to start on the 13th of March. We were in rehearsals in Los Angeles, um, you know, that week uh, before the first show. Um, uh, Praga Khan, the, 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 the main guy from Lords of Acid, and Marik, um, the singer of Lords of Acid, they were, they'd already flown over from Belgium with uh, Praga's wife, Inya, and we're in rehearsals and then we got told the day before the first show in Los Angeles 
the tour is cancelled. And from that point on, you know, from mid-March until now, you know, uh, nearly you know, to getting towards the, uh, the end of June, you know, three months later, I've been pretty much in lockdown. We all have. We've been in lockdown. And I sort of, what I'm really looking forward to is setting foot back on stage uh, with Lords of Acid or, or any band, you know, really just sitting foot back on stage and performing once again. <clears throat> it's going to be challenging, of course. Um, I've just noticed my, my friend Gary Newman has announced a tour of uh, uh, driving shows in the UK in August where I think you, you, know, you go with your car and it's probably set in um, large car parks, like arena car parks, and people will watch the show from a designated area with their car. A very interesting concept um, but yeah I'm just looking forward to life returning to normal where I can perform live once again I, I really miss it and to have that tour pulled away right at the 11th hour back in March it was very frustrating and you know what it was kind of funny because you know like um we have the proverbial rug like ripped right out from under us as artists and people who work in the entertainment industry it's 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 really hit hardest there because, you know, being able to do shows, being able to do dance parties, uh, you know, big entertainment events, it's, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer for that to be 100% normal again. But I mean, yeah. even though we've adapted with like live streams and, and, uh, you know, going, you know, performing online and stuff like that, it, you know, you still miss that, that, personal connection being in, in a venue space you know what's funny is that i was i had read a story uh today it was i was if somebody posted about the flaming lips i guess like the they had a picture of the flaming lips on stage in balls plastic balls and the crowd yeah. was in plastic balls you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> so yeah, solving I the, yeah. the, yeah. the problem it's, of social it's one, it's, it's one way around yeah <laughs> yeah Exactly. But, you know, it's like, I think that that's pretty cool that, you know, that, you know, that, uh, you know Gary Newman playing to a drive-in crowd, that'd be cool. Um, but I think, you know, as we continue to move into, you know, as we like you say the new normal right now, um, you'll see, you know, you're probably going to see a little bit less attendance, but the people will still come to the events like they'll they'll come to the events as we start to get into the normal and i'm sure like they'll live stream the events too and you can still watch yeah. and like you know buy tickets online as well for that too but yeah it's it 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 really sucks because a lot of our events that we were doing like just canceled across the board it's like flights yeah. and all this other stuff and i miss it i know you miss it i know everybody that you work with misses it but sooner rather than later we will be back to normal. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. What positive message would you give your fans out there? Uh, well, you know, the obvious one is, uh, you know, these are troubled times. Uh, you know, I think everybody should just be patient. I think everybody should be safe and continue to wear your masks. As I said, I go out there in Los Angeles and a lot of people wearing masks and some people aren't wearing masks. And I think, you know, we're not, we haven't seen the, the end of, we haven't seen the back of this, this pandemic just yet. Um, so I think people should just be, be safe. Uh, and obviously in light of Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, the, the message is tolerance and love for your neighbor, you know, no matter what their skin tone, uh, people should just be more tolerant with each other. We should learn from this to love our neighbors, this is definitely, the pandemic's definitely been something that's made us all reassess what's important to us, what's important in our lives. And, um, you know, I see a lot of good out there. And, uh, yeah, just more tolerance and love for your neighbour. But you know, be safe, carry on wearing your masks, you know, and this thing will eventually pass. Definitely right. Wise words right there, everybody, from Mark right here. You know, right now, during this time, it's important for us to listen you know what I mean? Listen and understand. And like you said, practice tolerance, you know, and also too, it's like life is a storm. Everyday life is a storm, you know, and now all of a sudden there is this clearing, you know what I mean? This, this clearing of like um, the time for reflection in our lives. And a lot of us, we were go, 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 go. And now all of a sudden, you know, it was just reevaluate what, what's important to us. So everybody out there, 
during this time, using this time to find out what's important to you and evaluating the things that you have in your life, that right there is what should be top priority, top priority for you. Because when this machine gets moving again to its full capacity, I don't want people to look back and kind of go, God, I should have did that. I should have started doing that thing that I wanted to do, or I should have started creating that thing I wanted to create. Um, so just use this time now to really kind of focus on the things that are important to you and build off of them, you know, because that yeah. is what's important. Yeah, wise words. Exactly. So thank you so much, Mark, for taking this time to have this conversation today. Thank you to everybody who tuned in to watch us talk. As always, if you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe to our Torfine YouTube channel as we have many more awesome artist interviews on the way. Thank you so much, Mark. I look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Cheers, guys. All right. Take care. Be safe. Love thy Definitely. name. <laughs>